leave uh, this channel, especially because it's going to be more like my, uh, Mike said, you know, permaculture oriented and everything. And then also it'll be as a backup when that inevitable day of permanent censorship comes to our regular channel. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised it hasn't happened already, really. What up, G's? Are we, uh, can you hear us? Give me a thumbs up. Okay. Awesome. Let's get going. We got the great Tom Barnett with us. Always a pleasure having Tom on. I think he's our, I think he's just taken back the record for being on the most self guests, actually. Okay. Awesome. And for good reason. Indeed. Here we go. I guess I should get on YouTube. Oh, there it is. Okay. Looking at Tom's face here right now. Get on good old douche tube. Oh, there it go. Is. Okay. Get your douches yeah. out. Here we go. Okay. And boom, we're back for another episode of Alpha Cast. I'm Mike Winner, and I'm here as always with the affable Dr. Bear Paul Lando coming to you live and direct from the great state of Jefferson here in an afternoon special live broadcast with the great Tom Barnett coming to us from down under, upside down, and all around down there uh, <laughs> on the flat plane on the other side. <laughs> um upside down back. you mean on a spinning globe yeah he's walking upside down it's wild and his toilet's going the other way and all this stuff <laughs> oh man i don't know how they do it counterclockwise life so uh, my hair fell out there's not too much time upside down just all the hair <laughs> fell off gravity man is that what happened yeah <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Well, hey, it's a pleasure to be back with Tom. Uh, Tom and I had a great little session on the end of COVID. Actually, you guys should check that out. Um, that was fun, Tom. And um, we were briefly chatting pre-show that we may even get a visit from Tom one of these days soon. So that would be really cool. And we'll shoot you shoot one of the uh, port sessions, back port sessions, or what are we calling them, Bear, that we're going to be featuring on our new Off Grid Elegance channel here. Porch Talks, and Porch. the first one will be aired in a matter of days. It's already in the can. Love it. And is that with like lemonade and uh, recliners and uh, no fly swatters because you're you're in a protected porch setting there? No mosquitoes? We have no insects here. It's We live in utopia. <laughs> That's correct. Well, we have them, but they actually, they give us back rubs and feed us little berries. <laughs> Are pretty cool we're we're like anastasia that's anastasia behind me by the way tom that's not my woke um i don't know if you see that that's not like yep. my woke painting moving into the slgbqt 1a34 existence that's actually anastasia if you're familiar with those books the russian mystic i was gifted yep. that um well, it's good reason why Tom is one of our most popular alpha cast guests uh, i think this is his fourth time on with us maybe fifth fourth i believe so i think that is a record now you um so congrats uh always good to have you on uh when tom speaks on sovereignty and law the healing arts or matters of spirit he does so from personal experience and in this day of dime a dozen influencers he is indeed a rarity tom barnett is a holistic health practitioner and mindset coach covering diverse topics from law culture and sociology to human health and spirituality Many people from all walks of life have found value in Tom's relaxed and calm demeanor while getting right to the point, providing valuable, stable content that will remain applicable for life. In this roundtable discussion, Bear, myself, and Tom will explore a diversity of subject matter to include the inclination toward religiosity. Religiosity? I say that right, Bear? Uh, yeah. In dietary trends. God, isn't that the truth? Uh, personal sovereignty, the essence of the male-female access, the agrarian renaissance, and Tom's Beyond Breath workshops. We will not be streaming on our usual alpha cast today. As you notice, you guys are joining us on Off Grid Elegance for use for use for use all listening out there. Um, please go follow us on our new YouTube channel, Off Grid Elegance. Uh, Bear and Deb will be using this as a platform to give you guys an inside look on what it's like to be farming in the beautiful AV gardens on the Smith River and uh, 
all the other stuff that we're up to at um, out there on the farm. Bear, take it away. Thank you. And I used uh, religiosity, especially for you, since you're a fellow parochial alum. I figured you'd appreciate that. Tom, good to have you back, my friend. It's uh, always a delight to talk with you. Uh, just share your insight and and hang out. And, you know, we have a lot of parallel um, endeavors that we enjoy, everything from surfing to different kind of sports. And, you know, that's really what floats my boat more than anything. But you're one of those people, as we already said, that in this day and age, it's a rarity that are out there doing it on the front lines and not just discussing it on the internet or or just a, a podcast uh, superstar. So I really respect you for that. And back uh, when I first started in the traveling circles in the 70s, th we were a very small in number and we were exploring, exploring the whole lawfare situation and as an offshoot of the banking industry. So we were taking measures to not only explore firsthand through uh, procedural law and and uh, educating other people through private gatherings, how everything works, but we're testing it out just to see if what we thought was true is actually true. And we found out that, yeah, we're all been taken for a ride and, and this whole thing has been uh, one big psyop. Uh, more than anything though, we found that these business, these people really mean business. And because our numbers were small back in those days, we could be isolated and picked off one by one. And I saw uh, close comrades uh, literally assassinated, incarcerated. I was targeted financially and, you know, went through a lot of sleepless nights with some of the things that we had to endure. Now, it's very gratifying these days because we have so many people out there sharing the same truths because of the Internet. And in one sense, it's encouraging in that so many numbers of people are waking up, but also there's a little bit of protection so that you don't have to go through a sac self-sacrifice just in order to stick your neck out, but there's still risk. But of course, it's allowed at this point only because the entire grid has been captured. And I'll speak here for the U.S. It's We live in very perilous but opportune times, I think, perilous because we are captured here in the U.S. Our financial system long ago, our media, our educational systems, our medical systems, and they've all been weaponized. And so, you know, we always try to keep up a, a good cheerful front and stay optimistic and also become solution-based more than anything. But People really right now have to understand this is it. And the one thing that they cannot capture unless we allow it is our hearts and our minds. And that is where our power lies. And I know I just want to give this little preface because I know that's pretty much where you come from. It's an inside job. And each one of us has to really get in touch with who we are. And we had a workshop here last summer uh, about these matters, and it was about sovereignty and how to protect your assets but it was really within the perspective of it's time that we own who we are and from that point it's a lot more powerful than any paperwork or anything that they can throw against us so i'd like our discussion maybe to go into that aspect of it and where our true power lies but at the same time, not just be Pollyanna about it and, and realize this is uh, a lot of risk out there happening. So if we are not aware of all the different ways that they are coming against us, then it, it could be actually dangerous. So we can touch a little bit upon all that. And then uh, maybe to start with or to end with, uh, it's up to you. We can go into some of the things that you've been up to lately. I know you've got a lot of great uh, projects that you're working on as usual. So if you can update uh, your new website, uh, your workshops and things, uh, all brilliant work. So Tom, thanks for being with us again. And uh, take it away, my friend. And maybe just uh, what have you been up to? All right. Well, thanks, Bear. And thanks, Mike. It's uh, always good to be back with you guys. And yeah, been up to a lot. 
I just, I really like how you started with that because there's, I think one of the main things that I see, obviously you've been in this game for way longer than me there. Like I remember actually our first chat where you had me on because I'd put out that video about, um, you know, the stuff. I don't know what we're supposed to say on this, but you know, the video that went around everywhere <laughs> and, the and the reasons why right. it was uh, popular. Cooties. And, uh, yeah. And then invisible you, cooties. The, yeah, exactly. And then you guys were like, yeah, like we've been talking about this for about, you know, three, four decades and it's just, it's not new stuff. And that's what I was saying as well. Like I've learned from several other people. I didn't figure it out for myself. Although I did put myself through the experience of figuring it out. It wasn't like you said, a, a book, uh, uh, learning for me, but then in the second half of the, uh, the chat, we ended up starting to talk about rights and you seem surprised that I knew about, uh, some of the, you know, ways that we've been enslaved and entrapped and where our minds are held and, and what we're really doing and all that. And I was kind of surprised too. I thought, oh, great. Like there's so many similarities here. And I think then we spoke in a second podcast we did about that parallel between health and rights in the uh, in the world like they go hand in hand because sovereignty quote unquote is like your autonomy or your self uh power so they go they they both operate under natural law so i thought that's it's a really good thing when you can see that there's a lot of other people switching on to these elements of life and so in saying that what i've noticed a lot is that there's been a big movement in the last 10 or so years in this you call it the sovereign movement or uh natural law or common law uh, anything like that. And what I have picked up on is that because so many people were starting to switch on that there is more than this corporate structure that we were put into, that there's been a lot of people put in place to, I guess, mislead and bring people into a whole big field in which it's a slaughter field, as in this is the way you do things and just come and do our workshop and sign this form and now correct this status and whatever. And then you'll just be a free bird. Don't worry about it after that. And I'm like, Oh, that doesn't sound right. That's not good. But that's where the majority of people want to go. And it's very similar to the diet world because it's like, just take these pills or uh, subscribe to this dietary philosophy and you'll be, you don't have to worry about things. And I think it preys on human nature where, yeah, we want to be free and we want to have more autonomy, but we don't really want to do what it takes to have that. So we'll go for the easy pickings of the low hanging fruit. Meanwhile, those people actually are the low hanging fruit for those that want to uh, bring them into their you know, spells and get their money and all that sort of stuff. And I guess it's really important because this day and age, especially through the last three years, a lot of that accelerated. And so a lot of people really bought into this idea of you only need to say this to a police officer or you only need to sign something that way or you only need to such and such. And of course, a lot of people got very disillusioned doing that because obviously that didn't do much. And Mike, I shared one of your posts recently because you just put together a little vid while you were walking around and you said that um, it's it's when you, when you really become that for yourself, uh, you are the solution. Like what you say will be the right thing. Like you'll, it's not a learnt thing. And I love that video that you did. So I shared that one around. And that's cool. really, like you said, Bear, that's kind of what I've been uh, working on for the last few years, mainly because <laughs> when there was the need to start speaking more about it, people were already in a fight. You know, it's like if someone's going to get in a fight as a sort of, you know, metaphor, not to, I'm not suggesting people get in fights. It's like you probably be better having trained for two, three years first. So that what you do in that situation is much more effective and or you could avoid it in the first place. But what we were seeing was a lot of people in a UFC octagon looking around going, what do I do now? How do I fight? And I'm like, too little, too late. But I guess you could sign something this way. I guess you could refer to this act. I guess you could do this knowing full well that it's like, it's not even enough because it's like, what happens when they counter that? And then you're like, I did the thing and then they did this and now I'm in jail. What do I do now? And it's like, well, it's just, you do, it doesn't work that way. You know? So some people did though. Some people, the people that got a lot of success, I think in the last few years were ones that tapped into something much deeper in themselves and they just, something clicked on. They were almost there anyway. They always had this feeling that oh, things aren't right. I think I'm here for more than this. I don't think it's how we're taught or told or uh, tried to force to be. And those people seem to get a real big kick through there. Like they learned a couple of little things and it just clicked in and they're like, ah, no, it's all right. I get it. But what they did really, I think, was just connect much deeper to themselves 
and therefore became the solution or became the right or became the uh, the sovereign or whatever you want to call it. And likewise, other people who were just coming at it out of fear, uh, purely out of fear and purely out of um, hate or fighting towards a government that they think controls them in the first place, which is the ultimate spell, then nothing within that paradigm or that mindset or that that resonance will give them any tangible results. It'll always be fighting because they're already in that paradigm. Uh, so those that managed to click out of that paradigm, they became that anyway, without having to learn, you know, volumes of legal uh, now or anything like that. And same with health, you know, it's just, it works the same way. You don't have to read 50,000 books. It's you, when you click into that different resonance or paradigm, you become that, you become more of an alchemist and it's almost irrelevant to, to a point. Uh, what kinds of food and that that you that you eat whereas if you stay in that if i have to figure it out it has to be milligram specific and accurate it's like your base resonance is saying you are not an alchemist like when people want to manifest they're like i want a million dollars i want to be healthy i want to be happy what they're really affirming is that they are not happy and not healthy it's just they don't realize that so they're constantly on that wheel and i think it really plays out a lot in this world of people wanting to become more uh, proficient, free, happy, healthy, but they're not, their base resonance is that they are not that. So they go, I got to go to another workshop. Maybe this guy who's got a new form that you can mm -hmm. fill out will, uh, that, that'll get us out of the banking system altogether. And I'm like, oh, it's you the, can, you can do that. It's the I want versus the I am. Yeah. <laughs> totally. And uh, like being in the ring, you know, that's a great analogy because if you're prepared, you're not going to be coming from emotion. And just like in the legal world, if somebody throws something at you, you realize they're just making an offer. And so if somebody's throwing a punch or a kick, uh, you simply, you can accept it or you can counter it. You can draft their energy against them. And uh, it's, it's so true of, of everything in life with uh, dietary regimes, with silver bullet cures that people talk about, we'll just take this pill and everything will be fine, or file this piece of paper. It not comes of experience. If you are a practitioner in the healing arts, you realize there are no silver bullets. You know, the only cure is inside of yourself. And all those external means are simply creating a window of opportunity. And then that window of opportunity has to be customized. It can't be the same for everybody. The same thing if the IRS is coming at you, there's not one piece of paper that's going to do it. There's going to be variable circumstances. And when it comes to health, Mike and I have done some earlier podcasts where I just talked about my tact when people approach me with diets, because I've seen every trend come and go. And we always have this big debate on what we should eat. Should we eat meat? Should we not eat meat? Should we, you know, and everything in between. But in reality, diet is a transitionary tool. And depending on our phase in life, uh, what we're going through, our uh, just phase of the seasons, our needs change. So if we really have our wits about us, just like in any other endeavor, it's about learning to find what works for us and not just following something uh, because it's a trend. And then, of course, what I read on your website the other day and why I used the word religiosity, people really get so emotionally attached to what they have adapted as far as a diet because they're not coming from their true needs. They're adapting an ideal and then that becomes like a political sort of hat that they wear rather than something in fact even works against their health because it be you know crystallizes this rigidity into their being which is the opposite of health so it's great because the the more you you get along here you find that all things uh have that common thread and if you just learn that one truth and how to really you know duck and parry as as life uh is thrown at you then it actually becomes fun. Yeah, really fun. And that's the thing. I think a lot of people, they take it way too seriously. And like you said, it can actually work against them because when people are overly uh, reliant on a diet or overly excited about like this way of eating, I get it. And because I've been through it, that's why I know what it's like. <laughs> so like, I just never made these mistakes myself. 
And I know that when you're in it, you're defined by it. It's like your, like you said, it's a religiosity or it's a politic. It's uh, something like that. So then what happens is you're actually a slave to it because it defines you. And then if you go outside of it, you judge it as wrong. If somebody else isn't doing that, you judge them as stupid or wrong or whatever, and you're right. And therefore it's like, it's a inherent base affirmation of you not knowing oneself, which is not a good place to be. And Therefore, for example, you know, I'm drinking this uh, green tea, which is really, really nice. But let's say it was, uh, I don't know, let's say for, for some reason, somebody else made it for me and used tap water and I didn't know. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, I love my good spring water with this green tea or that. And then, they, and then I'm saying it to myself and they yell out, oh, I use tap water. And then if you're <laughs> just like, what, what? <laughs> and then you start going, I can feel it killing me. I can feel it. You know, you just, the stress about what it is that you're doing is way, way, way worse than the tap water because the tap water in and of itself isn't the main thing. It's a part of many other aspects as to what it is. Not that I would willingly drink tap water, but my point is that a lot of people will self-destruct based on a judgment of what the thing is. And what I'm getting at really is it's an affirmation again of I am powerless. Like the, the force of life or God or creation that made me and the water and created the taps and allows all this stuff to go on. It's like, if I separate from that, then I'm a slave or a prisoner to the man-made element that I am afraid of. Because at the end of the day, if I wasn't afraid of it, I wouldn't really care. And yes, I'm not going to consciously choose a lower resonance of something like tap water. I'm always going to consciously choose for myself a better source of water. But I also know that if somebody accidentally served me tap water, it's not going to kill me. And as long as I stay in my essence of who I am and what made me and I remember that, well, I can technically transmute and purify that into something that is of God and not of that. And when you can see yourself as that, not in an egoic sense or I'm so great and I can just fly and I'll just jump off a building, like not stupid, but and not to use it as an egoic uh, action, which I'll get to in a second because I think it's an interesting uh, aside, (laughs) is that we are made a lot more powerful than that. Same with things like 5G towers or, uh, you know, like the chemtrails in the air and whatever. It's like, if we keep forgetting who we are and we keep forgetting that we actually are a lot more resilient than we might think and a lot more powerful than that, then yeah, we'll be a slave to it. And then when we remember though, we can actually experience a lot of uh, alchemical uh, phenomena such as clearing skies or, uh, you know, purifying a water to something that's extremely healthy because you actually are the thing that does that you're the vessel that does that the interesting thing i was going to say about the ego is that for everybody i've ever met that has a real gift if they are doing it in right action the gift is there but if they try to do it to prove something like oi mate let me show you how i can do this and it's purely out of ego the gift isn't there for some reason and so uh that's what i mean like don't it's it's going in the opposite direction. If somebody out of fear then pretends that they are the godliest force on earth and can just, you know, you know, blow up a 5G tower with their hand or something, then they're going to be harmed in the process. But if somebody just knows who they are and they just go, no, I don't want those signals. I'm actually going to do this or I'm going to, and it's not out of ego, then they actually can tap into that power a lot more. I think of ego as how the, I was just going to say, I think of ego as how the energy goes. And so it's your intent of how the e goes and so yeah everything is beyond the words right it's about the intention it's about what are the thoughts behind it because the words are just the after effects uh and i will just say one thing too what bear and i have said many times around diet it's just food what's the big deal and people get so triggered by that it's so pissed off by that go ahead bear Yeah, we get we get more flack from I, I get it from both ends because I'm a vegetarian, but I'm not a vegan. You know, I eat some raw dairy and eggs. And so you get it from the PETA folks, and then you also get it from the carnivores. And uh, and I've learned myself, like you said, uh, Tom, from experience, because at one time I was uh, you know, about 285 pounds playing ball and and just on that extreme and and then went through long periods, years at a time being a, a complete 100% raw food vegan, uh, just because I wanted to have the experience. And finally, you know, went through the different phases and, and figured out what works for me. And what works for me is it changes all the time. So um, yeah, what I was gonna say though, if somebody is at a true level of mastery where they could give 
demonstrable demonstrations of phenomena to other people. They wouldn't do it in the first place. Be, what would be the point? Because the people that you're trying to prove something to in the first place aren't, they'll just discount it in their mind five minutes after they saw it and tried to explain it away intellectually or or accept it gullibly. So you're you're really not achieving anything. Plus, you're just wasting energy. So the internet and all the different folks out there, uh, great folks, guru types, uh, take your pick. You know, we all have our belief systems and things, and some folks like to get out a little bit more in other ways and, and you know, for different reasons. But I think it's it's great because we can share a lot of information, but at the same time, it gives a platform for the folks that uh, want to be followers and the folks that want to be leaders. And what we really want to use this for at this point is just to share information because we're all in the same boat here, which leads me to my original comments and why Mike and I do this. And I know why you do this in the first place is to, you know, just move this along and as coming becoming a spiritual being, which we already are, there's no becoming or never was or, or, or anything. It's we are to clear ourselves to be a conduit to bring unqualified energy into this realm. And that's our whole purpose here. So if you are drinking a little gulp of fluoride or something, and from the perspective that we come here with that purpose as a powerful spiritual being, and we have a, a whole destiny that we have agreed upon before we even come here, that's not going to take us out prematurely. Uh, it's not like our creator is going to say, oh, shoot, I wanted uh, that person to be here a little longer to do such and such. If, you, if only he wouldn't have had that drink of tap water. So yeah, we, we have to balance it out and really start looking at things more common sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I was one of those people that was psychotically uh, like that. So that's how I know that, how that feels. I get why we feel that. But at the end of the day, what I noticed for me and also for then treating a lot of other people was that it is out of uh, a fear. It, it's a very, it's a base resonance of fear, which is just not, that they'll bind you. Like even with toxicity, a lot of people are afraid of it. And yeah, we've got very heavily sprayed skies like we were talking about before. And, um, but in my experience, what I've been noticing over the last several years is that the toxin, the thing that people are afraid of is the very end, 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 end result of so many other factors to the point where it's almost irrelevant. And what will bind that the most heavily is that base resonance of fear, which leads to the different emotions and thoughts and actions, and then belief systems and politics and, and ideologies and religiosities. That's what really binds that end, end, end thing of some barium, strontium, blah, 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 whatever. Whereas if there's nothing, if there's no major polarity, like a lightning strike to actually make that connection, it's kind of an almost an irrelevant thing to the point where perhaps it could even be alchemized into, into something very, very helpful, like gold or monoatomic something. I don't know. I haven't gone that far yet, but I do know that the, the toxin thing that people are so scared of and need to get out of their body all the time and never put it in there. It's binding to that base resonance of fear of not being powerful enough to deal with that. So, uh, and as somebody that was highly susceptible to that sort of stuff, um, I can just say that when I moved through that, then it was, it was all okay. But at the same time, it wasn't a pendulum swing. So when people are on pendulum swings, you're probably seeing yourselves a lot of times, that's when it's the same. It doesn't matter that they're a vegan and now they're a carnivore and now they're a vegan. And it's like the same base on unknowing it themselves is now just appearing with a different mask on I'm a vegan or I'm an activist or I'm a whatever, but it's the same base resonance and it never changes. So when we're swinging on pendulums, it's, it's not really uh, that healthy. So for example, you could be a devout purist when it comes to food. And then when you just decide you don't need to do that anymore, because you're more powerful than that. Now it's just pizza, ice cream and fruit loops. But that's a pendulum swing. It's not a true moving through to a different way of being. So the balance that you guys were talking about, it's all just food. A hundred percent agree. I think the trap then people fall into is just going, oh, great. I don't even need to grow my own stuff or eat organic or anything like that because it's all just food. So therefore, I'll just get frozen shit out of the supermarket aisle 
It's so much easier anyway. Why would I even think about what I'm eating when I could just go and like party and do whatever and just get a frozen meal out of the supermarket? I'm thanks, Alpha Vedic. <laughs> I'm so much more free now. I just uh, I'm so much more happy. So it's exactly. kind of like that's the that I know that's not what you guys are saying at all, but that's how people can sometimes swing on that pendulum as opposed to hearing something like that, which has a real resonance of truth in it, and that one. What a comment, phrase, whatever, uh, you know, whatever you want to call out of, hey, man, it's all just food. It's like you could go for a lifetime of knowing oneself through following just that one. You could put that on your wall and live by it, and it would help you in so many different areas as long as you, it allows you to keep moving through uh, on that pathway as opposed to using it as a, uh, you know, hey, every hole's a hole. It just doesn't matter. So then, it, oh, we're not supposed to talk about the T word or anything. But, you know, it's just kind of like, then you don't have to go through the sanctity or the honor or the or anything of something of God. You can just go and do whatever you feel like because it's all the same. You know what I mean? So it's like, there's so many things even wrapped up in that one little uh, way of looking at something, whether you're on a pendulum or whether you're actually uh, changing a, a resonance or a frequency in the way that you operate. So uh yeah, take it away, whatever you guys like to talk about with that. Well, of course, well, sovereignty is... Uh, go ahead, Mike, you go. No, you go ahead. Well, I was just going to say we talk about sovereignty and, and basically it's just uh, a lack of dependency. So growing your own food, yeah, of course, you, your food, you're going to be uh, getting fresh food, uh, it, much healthier for your biology. But the, the real health, I think, comes in that you're now cutting away another thread of dependency on somebody else just to have your sustenance. And what we're doing here is not just growing our own food, but creating a prototype. And there's a number of other people we're all aware of that are doing the same thing so that people can start duplicating what we're doing in every single community and end this whole age of dependency because I can, you know, I have a timeline where even back when I was a kid, it wasn't like this. There wasn't big supermarkets. There's a corner of grocery stores and uh, stores, but in rural areas, we all grew our own things and drank raw milk and, and life was very different. So to see this situation now where everybody's uh, dependent on lunch at the local deli and, and not much good after that, that's something that is obviously we can all see being used against us right now as supply chains slow down. We're starting to see in certain stores that uh, stocks uh, are a little bit lower, shelves a little bit more barren. I don't know what it's like uh, where you live, but you can see that uh, it's already began. It's not like that. I don't go to supermarkets, so I don't actually know, but um, in the places mm -hmm. that I go to, it's not. But we're also very lucky here. Like it is a bit of a bubble because we do get most of what we eat here comes from within a very short distance of here. Like the we have the farmers markets here that the farmers supply directly to, and even the the local like organic uh, grocery stores they still stock those same sorts of items and people and what have you. So not so much here, but I am very much aware of that. It's a slow squeeze, but it does seem like it is a slow squeeze on a certain class of uh, people. And it's more, not that, you know what I mean by class is in like the people who are reliant, that is squeezing the reliant class, whether they have not much money on welfare or they have a lot of money, they, they still are in a reliant, um, I, I would call it a class, but yeah. But yeah, so the people that are more like- Call it a mindset. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's a very hard thing to control. And that's why I think what you said at the start there, that I can't control the hearts and minds. It's so important to, if you have that, you have everything. And like Mike, when we spoke about um, the uh, the inside game, how we, I think we were talking a bit about wealth and I was saying that my, I've always felt that my wealth, my currency is what flows within and no one can take it. I could go anywhere in the world and that value will they'll represent as I can eat, I can have warmth and shelter because I don't have this mindset of anybody being able to squeeze that out of me. They could squeeze a bank account away, but I'm like, that's not my wealth. That's not my currency. Or they could change a crypto thing. And I'm like, that's not my wealth or currency. So then it's always like that for me, even with regards to food. So we get nourished on a lot of different ways. We're fed by who we're around. We're fed by uh, our news feed or whatever you want to call that on you know, social media or whatever. You, got, you can consciously choose that. 
So then if we just think that sustenance or nourishment comes from the garden, then I think that's also a bit of a, uh, it, it's a limitation. It's almost I'm reliant purely on the garden, but that's not really where food comes from in the first place when, especially because, you know, you're into your electroculture and other ways of helping to cultivate a garden, it's coming from somewhere else. So when we don't forget that, the only reason we would forget that is we become fearful. We're like, shit, it rained, the soil all washed away. We're going to starve. It's like, but that's not, yeah, I mean, I also don't want to go making people think that you just have to think about stuff and breathe the air and you're all sweet. Like you, you have to work, you have to harvest, you will go through periods of, oops, lost all that uh, produce, going to have to start again. You still have to work, you still have to put out in order to receive. But what I'm talking about isn't what's right in front of you, it's what goes into that. And what I'm saying is that if you don't operate from a base of fear and lack and loss, and then you will. You have still have to work, but what you do will be right action and it will come to returning you to food and wealth and sustenance and, and all that sort of stuff. That's more what I'm saying. Because I know people can misinterpret that as just going, well, I'll just meditate all day and wear a scarf and drink tea and I'll just be awesome. And it's like, no, it doesn't work that way. You have to, have to have, still have to work, but you'll return more when you have the right inner state for sure. There's a reason why we have a physical body and we live in this garden planet, <laughs> garden realm, because that is that direct connection with nature that grounds us into the growth model of the of why we came here, right? That the that the physicality is plays a very important part into the overall growth into ascending to a higher being or however you want to apply it in your spiritual realm. So to deny that is a, a bit of a spiritual bypassing. And you yeah. see these gurus out here that are all about meditation and they're quite plump in their robes as <laughs> you catch them at McDonald's or something. And so, yeah, when we say it's just food, we're talking about the after effects of the material realm and how, as you are so perfectly stated, Tom, it's the intentionality, the mindset, um, the stuff that's going on in here and in here, first and foremost, that will then direct what that food is. So if you're coming from a sacred place in your life, you're going to be sacred with every morsel that goes in your mouth. You're going to be conscious about what's going in your mouth. You're not just going to be shoving, you know, microwave pizzas and um, guzzling Paps Blue Ribbon all day, even though, hey, that could be fun too sometimes. But yeah, there's a sacredness to it, right? And I think that's something that I think a lot of people that run off saying, oh, cool, I can eat whatever I want. Well, they're disconnected from this the sacred nature of where we are and what we stand on and what this body mm. is. And what I what I did with that, Mike, because my journey was very, uh, very similar to figuring out germs and things, because I, I think I mentioned to you guys, I was very sick for a long time. I had chronic fatigue, very quote unquote immunosuppressed. We'd go through 13 colds a year, which on a 13 uh, lunar month calendar, that's one cold or flu per month of the year. It's ridiculous. And I was very, you know, not financially abundant and I would ride the bus everywhere. And I'd be sitting on a bus sometimes feeling a bit tired and some dude like, you know, down the front of the bus would just be coughing and coughing and coughing everywhere. And my blood would be boiling because I would see him as a threat to me. I'm immunosuppressed. Why do you have to ride the bus when you're like this? At least cover your mouth. And with every cough, it made my body like, like what kind of a place is that to live in? Because that's me coming from a huge base resonance of fear. And I, my health depends on those around me. We saw that during COVID. If, you're, if you don't wear a mask, mine doesn't work, that kind of uh, phenomena. So then Interestingly, I would also be avoiding anything that could potentially be toxic. I'd be like, is that organic? Is that organic? Is that organic? Where did this come from? Where did that come from? And in and of itself, it's not a bad thing because I'm becoming more self-aware. I'm becoming more uh, conscious of what it is that I want in my body and essentially establishing boundaries. No, I don't want stuff that's really bad in me. That's a healthy thing, but I was taking it to unhealthy territory. So then when I started to accept that I can actually be my body is able to do more than that and to do more with that, then I was like, oh, that's a level up. Same as when I then would ride a bus and just go, you can cough all you like. You can sit next to me and don't spit on me because I don't want to have to wipe it off, but you can cough all you like. It's not going to affect me because that's not how that works. And it's such a freeing and that's, that's freedom. 
Freedom is being able to sit around sick people or like in the Bible says to kiss the feet of lepers, knowing that you're not going to have your mouth fall off from leprosy. It's theirs. It's their expression, not yours. And so then when I was applying that to food, as I was getting more free, because I was imprisoned by my diet for sure and my health condition and my body. So then when I realized that I could transmute things and I wasn't a slave to quote unquote poor quality things, an interesting phenomena uh, then presented itself, which is this. If it's presented to me out of the goodwill of another, and it's the best that they can do, or the fact that it's a loving gesture, I'll have no problem eating their non-organic uh, whatever meal that they have prepared because there's another element to it, a lot of other elements, I should say. But I also won't willingly become lazy and go, I can't be bothered eating well today. I'll just go and eat takeout at the local derelict house thing <laughs> you know like just you know canola oil all over stuff fried up here you go and i'm like yeah that's good enough for me today because there's still a conscious decision and, and it's an interesting aspect because i know that there are buddhist monks and things out there who don't eat meat but if meat is presented to them they're like thank you very much and they willingly eat it because it's like this is an honoring of what is it's a there's a sacredness to it and likewise if i'm starving and the only option is uh some frozen pizza i'm well, I may go one way or another, but I just, the point is I don't have a polarity. I could easily not eat it, but I could also easily go, you know what? This is what life's presenting me. Yeah, it's not the best thing. And no, I don't support that way of farming or that kind of commercial uh, way of being in the world. And no, I don't support the quality of it. However, this is what's presented to me in the moment. And I will come into my sacredness and, and appreciate it for what it is and transmute it. But what I won't do is get lazy and go and get that sort of, pizza uh out of my conscious ch choice to push away something that's a higher decision in the moment for example so i think it's there's a lot of balance to it and it's also not to say that everybody needs to be in the same place even with things like uh supplements or uh modalities or whatever i've always felt that they are simply ways to help start to remember what's in us uh even using things like copper um rings and that that people wear i think they're great but I also think it's only mirroring what's inside of us. So to say to someone straight away, you don't need that sort of stuff. It's already in you. Just be that. If they're not there, it's stupid information. It's, it's pointless. You shouldn't even say that to somebody who does not understand that. So therefore, I'm like, yeah, you should wear a copper bracelet. It can do this. It can do that. And it's epic for this. And meanwhile, in the wearing of it, maybe over the course of that time, they might start to just, I don't think I need that anymore. Now they've actually clicked on and they've understood that that is just a representation or a reflection of what's in them, but you can't tell it to their mind. And then they just decide they're that powerful because they're not yet. They haven't come to that on their own by their own accord. So therefore the supplements, the different types of pills people can take, the different types of breath work modalities or yoga things or whatever, they're great. I never, cause I used to, I used to have that holier than thou complex where i'm like uh, don't you know you don't need that <laughs> and that's just that's a hugely egoic way to mistake and uh and i've definitely done that definitely guilty of that so i just think when i talk about these things it's interesting i th hopefully it's interesting for people to hear and to take in as a concept to consider it but don't buy it as truth and to also know that where you're at is really important to honor where you're at and if you do it's so important to be honest. And if you do know that you're living in base resonances of various types of fear, there's so that's not a bad thing. It's way more healthy to know that so that you can process and, and move from there than just go, nah, nah, fear's fear's gay. I'm not, I'm not fearful. What are you talking about? I, I don't live in fear. I'm, you know, it's like that's not healthy. That's not helpful. And it's not a bad thing because I think I believe, and I don't know this to be true, but I believe we all come in with that inherently because that's the test. I don't think there's anyone that doesn't have fear or at least didn't come in with it. I've processed many, many different types. And having done that, I'm also aware that I would still have many, many different types that I'm yet to grow into because of the stage of life that I'm at, the age that I'm at. I think there's definitely still more. I don't pretend that it's not there. But I do know from experience, I'm now not scared of chemtrails, 5G towers, uh, offers from the government uh, and felt my fellow man. I'm not scared of that or germs. I'm not scared of those things. And I used to be. There's definitely going to be other things that I am scared of. I just haven't got to those places to reveal those yet. But I also don't have a Messiah complex where I'm like, I walk without fear, ladies and germs. <laughs> <laughs>
I think the most detrimental thing about fear is being afraid of being afraid. And that's why if you're out there surfing and you take off on a bigger wave than you've ever experienced before, yeah, you're it, I, I think of my times in the past, it scared the shit out of me. But at the same time, I went for it because, you know, that fear was there, you acknowledged it. And I just didn't want to have to live with that fear holding me back from doing something. So in all the stories that we attach to fear, just fear, it doesn't matter if you're talking about 5G or a big wave or, or the government coming after you. It's just those are the stories that give us an excuse to hold on to that residence. So, uh, you know, what we're really talking about is the Christ consciousness. It's the middle way. And we talk about spiritual bypass. That's uh, an inclination towards the more the Eastern spirituality, which is fantastic. That part of the world was the memory banks for just helping us understand that we are spiritual beings, but then a great preponderance to seek out of body experiences while their material world was falling apart. These are more in past times. And then meanwhile, the other extreme here in the West, no inclination towards spirituality and just being over uh, involved in the physical medium. So I think what we're all experiencing now is putting the two sides together. And I always default to alchemy because those folks back then understood how processes actually work how physical matter precipitates, compresses, informational fields compressing through the ethers to create precipitation, including our biology. So I think when you understand those principles, then it is very freeing in one, uh, well, in a, in, a, in a big sense, because now you're no longer thinking that you are uh, dependent on everything outside of you that you have a big say as far as how all that goes but then also and with the realization that we're all a work in progress so you don't start getting all full of yourself or thinking that you're going to be a breatharian overnight either but it's also very gratifying to know that if there isn't something to eat today well that's okay too i can go a few days or 20 days without food even though I'm still eating food and, and I'm not going to die just because I, I miss lunch. And a lot of folks out there, if it really hits a fan and if they miss one single day without food, there's going to be real chaos. Yeah. Do you think that's, um, that's most of the world? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, Western saying. world, I should say. Do you think that, yeah, definitely an epidemic of overeating people could definitely, you know, take a day off for sure. I think everybody should take a day off of eating right now in the West. Try that once a week, guys. Um, do you think they'll fear? So I was talking with about this actually a couple of nights ago with Sam Tripoli. I was on one of his podcasts and um, I was kind of talked into becoming a volunteer firefighter and Bear was a professional firefighter in his younger years. And um as an act of service. And I got to admit, like I get calls where I look down on my phone because I got an app and it tells me what, what it's to expect. And I am in fear of going on calls where I may have to save someone's life by giving them CPR, or I might not come through on it and they may not make it out because of me. And so I guess my question is, fear seems to play a vital role in the growth process when we're challenged by it. And I don't think anybody can ever fully live in this realm without fear because i believe according to our hero's journey we will be tested that's why we're here to be tested right so of course how do we face the fears is what matters the most and that's something i'm still challenged with when i get that call so and i think barry you hit it right on the head uh, the christ consciousness middle ground but tom just curious what your thinking on that is what is the role of fear in the end and how is the best way to achieve that mastery? There's different types. I think what you're referring to is the, you know, there's a tiger that's a, that's just appeared in the room. If you're just like, meh, well, you're going to probably going to die. It's a, you, I think if you have, if you do not experience fear in that respect, such as, look, I've got to perform now. Uh, I have to like, there's a, you know, I've taken off on a wave. This, but this is not what I was expecting. This thing is just jacked up twice as big. A lack of fear is not a healthy thing. Uh, a lack of fear when it comes to needing to perform because it's an act of service is not a healthy thing in my experience. I think that element of fear is there to help us grow and to help test us and to help us come back to God, to help us realize that essence of ourselves, which 
in my understanding is what the Christos is anyway. It's that, uh, that Christ oil inside. But then when, what I'm referring to in, in having, in not having the fear, it's not situational fear. It's not when you think of something like, what if this happened to me when I'm walking outside with my wife? I, I don't know how I would, that's a healthy fear because you're willing to go to a place that is uncomfortable. I think that's what that kind of fear is, you know, willing to take off or paddle out into ways that you haven't actually been out in. You're going to unexplored territory, but what it's showing is a willingness to go there. And likewise, when you have thoughts about, shit, what if there's a guy bleeding out and I don't actually know what to do to, but you're going there, you're going there consciously. And as you guys talk about all the time, like the, this metaphysical switching into physical is, is how the alchemy works. And I think a lot of people aren't even willing to quote unquote go there, but the fact that you're willing to go there shows courage and that shows a trust or a faith in the element of God that, that uh, is moving through us. So what I'm talking about though, is the base resonance that applies to everything that you do, whether you feel physical fear or not. It's like, oh, I'm not going outside today because there's chemtrails. You're not feeling fear about it, but your inherent base resonance is of lack of disconnection to uh, your creator. That's more the fear I'm talking about is a disconnect. So anyone can take you for a ride. You are essentially in the deceiver role because the fear is a deception. I'm talking about metaphorical fear, not like there is actual a reason to feel anxiety or fear or doubt, but the willingness to go there transmutes that. And likewise, the willingness to connect back to what we are is breaking illusions and that's a willingness to go there a willingness to trust and have faith in something that's much greater than us and what put us here so i see them as two different things but i see both of them this i see both of them as a path to faith and trust and to reconnect uh and a, and a, a willingness to go there and a willingness to go there is really a willingness to be alive because the way i've always seen it is that if someone fears death technically they fear being alive and there's a phrase, there's a book that was written. I love the title. The title was Risking Being Alive. And I'm like, that really resonates because it is a risk. Like to go and go after what you want, that's a risk because the bigger that is, the, the harder you could fall, the more rejection you could experience, the more uh, as a flip side of failing, you could feel disastrous inside. It's a risk. It's a risk to want to be more in life, to, uh, to not follow the herd. There's zero risk in following mandates and doing what you're told. No risk whatsoever. There is risk in going, I know that's wrong and I'm not going to do it. And you're like, what's going to happen? Because I don't actually know my rights or the laws, but I know it's wrong and I'm still going to say no. It's like, it's a risk. You're going to feel fear and that's a healthy one because you're willing to go there. You're willing to test and that's perfect. Like something shows up in a presence in your life that is a reward for doing that. It's a sign. You come across the Alpha Vedic or something, you're like, oh shit, there's actually guys talking about good stuff. I can tune in and I can like nourish every week or whatever it is. Something shows up as a result by you trusting and having the faith and being willing to go there. So that's really for me what it's about is, uh, is it's so important. Like you said, Mike, it is the hero's journey. And it's, it's important that we continually go through that. And I don't, not that I, I don't know. I don't think I've ever come across somebody that doesn't, is not still going through a hero's journey. And I have met two people in my life who I would consider to be somewhat of uh, an ascended master or whatever you want to call that. People who can energetically, I've seen them do some, I've seen the phenomena that they can do. And I'm like, well, that's, I don't know how you get there, but I still don't, I still see them as a human being in other, because they'll do stuff or they'll have these traits where I'm like, that's, not what I would expect of somebody who can do those things. They still have these elements of they're not there yet in other ways, but they're phenomenal in something like they can actually do miracles kind of thing. And, but they can't tie their own shoes. And so, uh, <laughs> I, yeah. I'd love to bear. And I know you have a comment on that, but I'd love to then touch on this concept of excellence and reaching towards excellence and reaching towards an ascended state of perfection. Because in this culture, there seems to be, especially like in the sort of woke millennial um, generation, and that's not a put down on millennials. And a lot of you are listeners that are awesome, but there tends to be a trend where, and this was more probably developed by the institutions where it's not about excellence anymore. It's about parity. It's about um, togetherness and and not being the winner everybody gets their participation award 
uh, you can't be perfect, right? Nobody's perfect. And we've kind of lost that, right? There, this idea of trying to achieve perfection and excellence and ascension, like ascended, the whole concept of an ascended master is you are always aiming to be perf as perfect as you can so that you can achieve that ascension and get beyond the hero's journey, it ascend beyond it. Um, What's your thoughts on that, Bear? Because I know you've been following the Ascended Master stuff forever. You're the one that introduced me to it. Well, the only thing the teachings would add to that is in the meantime, while we're in transition, and once you ponder the concept of ascension, they say you are already in the process of ascending. And the only pitfall along the way is judging yourself for having experiences that are helping you get there or judging others, because of course, then you create that resonance within yourself. And Tom, you know, a couple of characters that I've uh, had intimate associations with that were able to achieve certain phenomena, the first thing they would do at any act of surprise of those sorts of occurrences, you know, when I was observing it, was, they just kind of chuckle and, and say, well, you know, their attitude is, well, how is it that you don't know how to do that? There's nothing really to learn. It's just that's our normal state of being. But uh, but yeah, I'd be more interested in just getting uh, uh, Tom's take on things. And then also, Tom, if we could use this as a segue, maybe to get into some of your practical work, and I'm especially interested in your beyond breath work. Sure. Can I just ask a real quick question first, though, and then we'll talk about that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, sure. Just because like you're... <laughs> You're one of those people, Bear, that I know is like far beyond where I am. And like, I, I like following what you do. You're a lot older and wiser and it's I, I can learn a lot. And I'm just wondering, I completely agree, is that uh, that element of shedding illusions to me or the spells that we're under is the way that we regain our levels of power. So we've got all these layers in front of us that are like muting our resonant frequency. And as they shed away... Like you said, it's not learning how to move stuff around with our mind or whatever. It's just as you move those away, that grows as a result. But then I just I am have been wondering whether everybody has that ability. Or like you said, if you're even aware and you're consciously choosing or deciding on that path of an ascended master is I don't know if that's a just a generic term for a lot of other ways to say the same thing, but using that term, then you're already on that path. There are a million to one ratio of people who are not aware of or choosing that and therefore would not become that. But is that because it's a conscious choice or is it because as we're born into this realm in whatever manifestation or timeline we're in and whatever, are some people just actually there would, they don't even have the ability to choose. So those of us listening to this have the ability to choose because we're accepting it as a potentiality and we're not like, we could choose that. And in the choosing of, we're already on that path, right? But then there are so many more people out there who, uh, even if you told them about it, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is there such a thing as like NPCs and people who like just are not at the same resonant frequency where no matter what happens in this life, they will always put on a mask. They just can't, they can't because of their design, choose anything different. Whereas other people like those that, you know, listen to this sort of stuff, have the ability to choose. And I don't know if that's a design or not. I don't know if that consciousness, I, I know it's a consciousness as in it can choose a resonant frequency, but are we limited? I guess another way to put it is like, imagine <laughs> imagine you got a lighter and a spoon, right? And we're, we're born in at the lower end of both. Now wearing a mask or something somewhere in the middle, but can a lighter become a spoon? So what I mean is if your if your potentiality in this lifetime is limited by your design to go to the bottom of this or to become, hey, this is a good thing, or to become a light at the top, or are you a wooden spoon and your resonance can go from here to here, but not one can't be the other. So that's just an, an analogy for are there people born into this world that are purely numpties who will never, ever be able to become an ascended master, even if they did choose? And likewise, or are we, do we all come in and have the same? Are we all created equal? I think that's more the question. That was a long winded way. Bear, are we all created equal? <laughs> or are there people who just by virtue of being here by their design have a much greater potentiality that others will not have? Uh, well, my belief is that uh, we are not equal, but we all have uh, potential. 
And equality, of course, equates more to, are we ready to realize this? So it's a matter of divine uh, timing. Uh, Bear, you well. broke up there. You were saying something important. We're ready to realize what? So we're talking about differentiation between potential and equality. Uh, we all have potential, but we're not equal. And equality, of course, is the realization of potential. And the realization of potential is all about divine timing. So some people come in with a memory and are ready to realize more potential. And others are signed up for a different experience. And then, of course, if you get rid of the concept of time and get out of that uh, even timelines of lifetimes, embodiments as being successive in that way and think of everything as simultaneously, then it's real hard to get caught in that trap of thinking of yourself as a whole, uh, an old soul or a young soul and, you know, equating that with somebody that's more spiritually evolved. Uh, myself, the one thing I think that age is very useful for is that you have more opportunity just to have your ego just get the shit beat out of it so many times that it finally succumbs and just says, okay, uh, at that point you can succumb and get your tail between your legs or else you can say, okay, it's not about my ego and I'm ready to just be open to whatever, you know, I'm here to do in the first place. So age is not necessarily wisdom, but I think if you take those life experiences, it sometimes can be harsh and realize they are uh, not just meant to teach us. I don't believe we are ever intended to learn from evil. You know, God, God doesn't create evil for us to learn by. That's our own doing. But when our own creations come back on us, then there's that opportunity to say, okay, there's there's much more going on here. And if you're in that mindset, it probably means that divine timing is such in that particular embodiment that you're ready to move on. And then, of course, if you start talking about ascension, that's pretty lofty ideals, which brings us back very often into the trap of, well, you're always falling short of being an ascended master, which means you have no attachment whatsoever to anything on the material plane. But it goes back to diets. We're in transition. There's no right, wrong. It's just an experience. You look at the elements in the ground. They're always in transition. One's becoming the other. You look at microbes under a microscope. They're always in tra transition. One becoming the other, depending on a certain function that needs to be met at that time. Same thing with us in our embodiments and our phases of life. So to me, the ascension, and I'll just default back to the what I believe are the most authentic ascended master teachings that have not been adulterated with new age infiltration because they go way back since the beginning. Uh, they would always admonish it. it has nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with being in any particular place. It's just realizing why you're here, understanding how things work, and then opening the door to the fact that there are higher realms of consciousness that are waiting for us to invite them in. And then as soon as you do, then the magic really starts to happen. And then you don't have to really do anything but to stay in that receptive mode. Of course, it also uh, means that we have to be proactive on the ground because the reason why we're here on the ground is because those masters need awake people inviting them in in order to do the work that's necessary to transform this realm in the first place. Could I add one cherry on that uh, to your Please question, do. Tom? Uh, from the pearls of wisdom that I've gathered from Bear over the years and reading all the books he suggested to me, one being a great fictional tale we did a whole alpha cast on called The Red Lion, elixir of life and this idea of karmic repercussions for the actions that you do the causality factor that comes into play with your embodiment from previous lives and from your current lives so no i don't believe anybody comes in the same everybody comes in the same because there are repercussions from what you've done before and you're re-embodying to um move from those but also on that same 
point, as Bear is saying, there is the potentiality for you to turn it all around with the flip of a switch. This notion of atonement that comes out of Christianity, I think there are elements of, of truth to that, but I think a lot of that it was played up by the Catholic Church and by institutions to sort of mind enslave us to this idea that we're born with original sin and we have to atone for who we are as a sinners. But this notion that um, we all come in the same and um, we're all the same, um, I, I don't think that is fair to natural law. If you were a rapist psychopath in your previous uh, life, you know, I think there is elements to where you have a bigger hill to climb in this embodiment, but you can do it, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I just figured it was more a case of that uh, there's just more layers in front of somebody. So if a, if somebody who was, you know, a higher being or something just said to you, well, how come you don't know how to do such and such that I just did? It's like, is somebody that is on that path, do they just have less layers to go, but they still have the same element of gold within them? As opposed to somebody who can't even receive that message, do they have the same element of gold within them, but it just has so many, call them karmic layers, call them illusions, call them uh, indoctrinations, traumas in front that they're just never going to get to it in this lifetime. I don't well, know. Could I be guess like it's more two, two people training to run a mar win a marathon and one happens to have made decent dietary decisions in their life and are in decent you know, shape, not great shape, but want to train. Then you have someone who is just morbidly obese because they've decided to do that to their lives and probably aren't going to have a chance of winning that marathon unless they pull off some amazing training, right? Like some hardcore training. So they have well, a lot so, more layers to shed. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. But I've also done a lot of experimenting with uh, really assessing people. And one of the reasons I've done that is because as I grew I I think I just came into this world slightly different. I already knew that when I was a kid and just when I say different, I just mean to my immediate surroundings and the people, my family, uh, the people that I associated with in the neighborhood, the school and all that sort of stuff. And it bred in me a lot of uh, like, I had to really bring myself up emotionally and spiritually because I was not provided for in any way like that as a kid. And so what I started to be able to do was observe a lot of, of what was around me. And it's uh, something I developed quite well. And one of the things I have done always is whether I was choosing to or not, if I look into the eyes of different types of people, I see a lot of different things. And the more I've aged and the more I've experimented with observing things on different levels, I've come to the conclusion that we're very, very, very different from one another. And you can explain that in many different ways. We have different constitutions. We have different astrologies. We have different cosmologies. We have different bloodlines. We have different ancestry. There's a lot of different ways to like cognitively explain that. But what I'm experiencing is that I feel a way, way different uh, origin in a lot of different people that I come across. And I've definitely looked into the eyes of people who just, I don't think that they would ever know what you were talking about. If you said, how is it that you don't know that? I think you could strip back every onion layer that there is and they still wouldn't get it. Whereas there are others that just have a different kind of spark, a different, a different, there's just some different makeup. Like technically we're all human beings and on the surface, but then as you go through each layer, I'm like, it's almost like you're from a different star system. You're from a different land from somewhere else. You do not come from the same place that I come from. Once I get deeper and deeper into somebody's like, uh, being their makeup. And that's just why I wonder, and it's only an out of interest. I don't really care about the answer. It's more of just, uh, this is an interesting concept to, uh, to like ponder. <laughs> and so I just, yeah, I'm, my, my thought is that we're not, I just think some people could strip back all of those layers and never know what the hell you were talking about. If you're like, how do you not know how to do that? I'm not sure that they could do it. And then, you know, other people talk about it in so far as there's greys, there's reptilians, there's this, and there's all these different, there's Pleiadians and all this other stuff. And I'm like, I'm interested in that to a degree, but most of it seems too much in the realm of I'm just trying to think of something as opposed to I can see it. But I'm just coming from a place of uh, the more I've been growing up the, and the more I'm willing to look into people and into myself, I'm seeing such differences in all of us that are here. And that's why I think it's also amazing because it does mean that we, at least those that can even ponder that have a much different resonant purpose, like some spectrum of those millions and millions of different colors in the color spectrum to occupy that one that is you 
and and that you add to the whole to create everything it's really really uh humbling to have that kind of uh uh, I don't know, just a feeling about things. And that's just why I'm always interested in people that have seen more than me, if that's somewhat resonates with them as well. If you can buy the concept that we are all individualizations of the creator and the whole purpose of individual twofold to expand universal consciousness because each individualization is a unique lens. Otherwise, there would be no purpose in individualizing the creator in the first place uh, and it would be uh, counterproductive to expanding consciousness uh, by way of looking through all those uh, unique lenses and at the same time it gives every individualization an amazing opportunity to be a powerful spiritual being with the responsibility and the prerogative to create however we wish at our point in consciousness forevermore, as long as we obey universal law. So uh, when you're saying it seems like we're all from different planets or, you know, different realms or different star seeds or whatever, uh, you know, that's very true. We're, we're absolutely unique, every single one of us. And that's the great crime uh, as far as the control grid that tries to make us all uniform and think the same and have the same thoughts. And the other thing I'd add to our earlier discussion is that there's a reason why there's a great grace in us getting amnesia between embodiments because we have all done many wonderful things and that energy is a very positive energy that's held in our causal body that when we get the hang of it, we can actually draw from that to precipitate any experience we want this time around. And at the same time, we've all done very heinous things, most likely. And our whole job is to forgive ourselves and to use those. So um, I don't think there's probably any one of us that's been any worse than the other. But since most of us have a difficult time just finding forgiveness uh, towards ourselves with all the experiences and this time around wouldn't it be a difficult task if we were aware of everything that we've ever done in any embodiment and in fact in the ascended master teachings they address that and they only allow people to look into their past experiences when they are of a very um let's just say evolved nature where they're not going to go into self-judgment if they see some of those past experiences and now it's time for them to look at some of them for only a, a learning purpose. So, um, yeah, I don't think it's a matter of uh, somebody being more bad than the other person and therefore having to atone more. It's all about forgiveness. And they say that as soon as you forgive, it's over. You know, it's not about original sin or you talk to somebody in an Eastern practice and how you doing today? Well, I'm doing my karma. You know, it's kind of the same, the same concept. No, we're not here to do our karma. We're here to procreate and we're here to forgive ourselves so we can get on with procreation. That's just my take on things. And when you apply those principles and that philosophy in life, uh, I'll just say from personal experience, it's, uh, it's a tremendous burden relief from your shoulders and things get a lot lighter from that point on. Nice. I love it. <laughs> So uh, I'll I'll talk about the, the breath thing now. Just uh, thanks for going through that because it's a uh, few things clicked in there as well. Uh, so I years ago when I was really really devoid of energy, I became aware of breath work. Some maybe twenty years ago, uh, especially it wasn't really a new concept because I'd done martial arts and I was uh, taking an interest in yoga and some of those sorts of practices. So breath work was not a, a foreign idea to me. But then I became more aware of the various different types and the way that when you can work with breath in various ways, you can change your physiology, whether it's the type of nervous system that you're operating from primarily, you can have, uh, you know, uh, out of body experiences, you can have visions, somewhat psychedelic in nature, similar to what people may describe if they're on acid or, uh, you know, something like that. So uh, my initial interest in it was from a performance point of view because I was so egoically driven in sport I had to be the best at things so if I could do a longer breath hold than somebody else if we were diving or something then I was good <laughs> if I could 
outperform somebody in the pool or have a lower resting heart rate when we're testing ourselves in the physiology lab, then I'm great. I'm awesome because I have the lowest or I can hold my breath, whatever it is. It was very egoic. I was looking at it as ways to perform better. And then um, as I was learning more about myself and about women, I assumed I could perform better if I could control my male uh, need to penetrate the world uh, the best. So then I also use breath as a way to control my ability to like control myself in a sexual nature. So then it, it was always about control though. What I, I really noticed, it was about performing and about control. And then, you know, later, and I mean, I just kept on that kind of path, but then I noticed that there was a lot of things coming to the popular culture, like Wim Hof became really popular. And it seemed also a little bit like what I was like, because it was about, you can do the coldest for the longest. You could hike this in board shorts instead of wearing clothing and whatever. And I think it was good because I brought um, breath work back, I think more to a mainstream consciousness, but it always seemed to lack something for me in so far as it was about uh, achieving, or it was about, um, and there was something about it that seemed very familiar to how I got into that way of doing things in the first place. As a quick uh, aside, there's this whole return in society towards masculinity, for example. And there's figureheads that I believe are chosen and what have you, but that's a different story, such as Andrew Tate and people like that, who I'm not super familiar with, but I've seen enough to just go, that's not really what it is. But a lot of people are like really transfixed by it because there's a message that seems to be missing. But to me, what it does, like any kind of control, is it gives you one side of it and completely leaves the other out so that it's actually not leading anybody forward for themselves it's just another form of entrapment and i've seen that a lot with breath work it's always marketed towards like release your traumas because you just do breath work and you won't have traumas anymore or uh whatever it is it just seems to have this element of it being for something very specific as opposed to just like you know you guys talk about the inner side of things where it's a more of an exploration and it doesn't matter about cold therapy or wearing board shorts in the snow it doesn't matter about showing somebody that you've released your i got bashed when i was a kid trauma it doesn't matter about something external it only matters about what you become uh, as a result so when i was working through a lot of my issues and coming like health issues and coming across this is one of those people bear that i'm talking about he taught me a lot about the gentlest aspect of breath and where you can't connect to that if you are consciously doing breath work. Is breath work still powerful? Absolutely. I still do, just for common term, call it Wim Hof style breath work. I still do that. But what was always lacking was this other, this more yin element that just got to the almost like a zero point, I would call it, because it didn't have an intention. It didn't have a, an outcome or a goal. It was only to connect to the gentlest aspect of the self. And in that gentlest aspect of the self, is where the essence of ourselves lie. Not many people, as I've been learning in our lifetime, get to experience their essence, like what they are at, the, at their essence. And you can definitely uh, get a glimpse of it through a near-death experience or uh, uh, witnessing the birth of your child or something like that, something very profound that shakes you out of the illusory reality that you are normally subject to. But it's also there all the time, and it's the current of life. It's the waters. It's like, when we talk about currency and currents in seas or Jesus walking on water or any of these kinds of uh, terminologies, to me, what it's always referring to is the essence and the essence is in the waters and the water carries light. So when we can connect to our essence, it's something that it, it's always there, but we're always too busy to notice. So we're coming from a different place than the essence. So yes, you can get to it a million different ways. I still believe all ways are way or every road leads to that place at some point. But the thing is, if you can get to the stillest, most gentlest aspect of oneself, you can tap into that consciously at any point in time, as long as you're not intending so hard to get there. It's a letting go and, it's a, and you can just be there. And the better you get at it, the more you can at any moment, just, just drop and be there. And then in that space is devoid of time, is devoid of uh, past, present, future, is, is your ancestry all in one element in and of itself. And it's difficult for most people to get to. And that's why people are drawn to things like, I'll do yoga, I'll go to meditation, I'll go to, because they're trying to find it. They know that they're trying to find it, but they're just going through all these other avenues before they actually get there. And in and of itself, none of those things are a, are a way to get there, but they can be if you pursued them long enough, for example. 
So in Beyond Breath, I just went through some simple exercises of which there are probably thousands of ways to connect to that gentlest aspect. So when you're doing Wim Hof, for example, like just call, that's not what it's called. That's just a generic, <laughs> people have been doing that for thousands of years in different yoga practices, for example, but you are very aware of your breath. You are consciously choosing to chase it. It's very audible. Everything about it is very like you're in it. Whereas in the program, what I show is that there are ways to just go it, it, almost completely opposite. You're almost completely unaware of it, although you're highly connected to it. It'll be completely inaudible. It'll be almost imperceptible, not just to an outside observer, but to yourself as you, as the observer of yourself, it'll be almost imperceptible. And then through that, you can break into that other place. That's just like, oh, this is a whole other realm that I did not know existed, but is always there. It's like carrying all of that wisdom. Uh, so that's, it's something I wanted to do for a long time, but never really had the place or the time or the inclination to actually explain elements of how we respire. And respiration or respiring literally meaning to respirit, like the spirit and the breath are one, like a lot of Greek terminology, like pneuma, and a lot of it means breath and spirit are one. And so it's it's really just as I say, and as I say in the program, it's not like I'm claiming that you do this and you'll just be connected to spirit immediately. I'm just saying we always are, but there are ways to actually remove some of the layers, some by an intellectual learning. So the knowledge can help you as a sign, as a pathway to go, all right, just put more energy here and you can get towards it. And a lot of it is just in the most simple of things as, as usually that's kind of part of natural law, right? It's like, sometimes it's just the simplest, easiest of things. It is almost so stupidly simple and easy to do that. You'll never do it. You have to go climb a mountain instead. It's like that in itself is the degree to which you are separated from the ability to find that place. And you won't find it on top of the mountain either because you weren't chasing it. So it's kind of, it's like that kind of old philosophy is uh is really the uh embodied embedded in that so uh but yeah that's like honestly like that's really all it is it's the complementary opposite to a lot of the more intentional more outward breath work that people do which i still think is great and there's a i still do it i'm not i never would say don't do that it's not the right way to do breath work i'm just saying that a lot of breath work like a lot of diet carries with it a lot of dogma and a lot of um this is meant to be this or this is how you do it or only do it and I'm just giving a complementary opposite to that so they can balance each other out and you have other ways or an, another way to actually uh, get to know yourself. Yeah, I think it goes back to what Mike was saying about eating every little morsel that you put in your mouth is sacred, uh, just like every breath should appreciate it, I think, in the same way. It's uh, just like it's all food. Uh, air, as we think of it, is actual living energy. It's prana. And in alchemical terms, it's the mercury. It's what gives, allows life to animate itself. And the mercury is anonymous. It's just there. It's, it's the God energy. It's pure consciousness. But then when we bring it in at the soul level with every single breath into the sulfur, as the alchemist would say, then it becomes exactly what we want it to become. So if we're in appreciation of every single breath and you know like in hawaii where i lived for a long time uh they called outsiders how it became sort of a racial per, uh, pejorative but initially it was um, a term that was used by the natives that saw these missionaries come in and uh, from their perception these missionaries were disconnected from spirit you know they're coming completely from the mental plane so they called them howlies which literally means without breath breath meaning spirit so uh prana wow. spirit mana whatever name you want to put on it it's that anonymous energy that just like food we can qualify it any which way we can and you're so right tom is all the different breathing techniques out there and in the martial arts breath is just considered a strategy well there's sometimes you're going to be doing regular breathing sometimes reverse abdominal breathing sometimes you know depending on what you're trying to do it's not a sometimes embryological breathing fire breathing they all have different purposes so they're just different strategies and uh, and after all how many videos can you watch of somebody doing wim hof breathing in a in a tub full of ice so um yeah, it's just, uh, it's good because I think Wim has done a great service uh, 
Uh, you know, I love his technique, the cold, it's very valid. But then again, it becomes another ego thing where we're all showing off, you know, whatever. <laughs> Seems very but, Western um, too. Yeah. It's very Western. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, 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 there's a, one of my favorite authors, H.W. Percival. I've talked about him a lot on this show, probably annoying people by now, but it's interesting because he talks about, and he was a writer in the early 20th century. He was very much influenced by by ideas of like Walter Russell and, and stuff. Um, but uh, he talks about the breath form being the main way we externalize the actual thoughts that come from spirit, from our higher mental body. And that every breath is us externalizing those deep intentional thought, uh, that singular thought. And that's how we put it out into the physical. And that's how it enmeshes with other breath and creates and manifests. So I only bring that up because that goes back to this idea of the sacred and as bear was saying with every single breath you take and exhale it is your life it is your what you're bringing to the world coming out from the deeper parts of you to the world and when we're doing wim hof there's a great strategy behind parts of your kind of hijacking your neurology and stuff but you are just kind of you know just spitting out those frantic ideas out to the world instead of having this more sacred sort of acknowledgement of your divine connection. Yeah, it's also good though, you know, like we're talking about before where uh, some things are there just to help, you know, like different diets. So if you have no idea about food whatsoever, going on like a paleo diet is a good thing as long as you see it as a step and not not an altar that you uh, worship, right? Because then you're a subject or a slave to it. But if you if it's a stepping stone, like you guys were talking about, it's great because it refines your ideas. It's like, okay, processed food, bad, whole food, good. Yay, well done. Like you've leveled up a bit, but then you can move beyond that as long as you don't make that your God. Processed yeah. food, bad, whole food, good, all hail. Whole food. You know, like as long as you don't have that kind of <laughs> attitude. And likewise, for most people in society who never get tested, never been through a rite of passage, having a three-minute ice bath is the best thing that they can probably put themselves through. But then if they don't grow beyond that, where it's a, an egoic conquest and realize there's much more to life than that, then they're limited by that. And that's why they're like, well, now I'll do a four minute ice bath. Well, now I'll do a seven minute. Do you ever see, um, did you ever see how uh, there's something about Mary with Ben Stiller and uh, oh, yeah. it was Ben Stiller. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's <laughs> like, he's in the car with that psycho. And he's like, do you ever hear of this thing? Eight minute abs. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's cool. There's seven minute abs. And he's like, unless of course somebody comes up with, six minute abs then you kind of screwed he's like what what no 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 one's going to come up with that because <laughs> it just becomes this thing of like if i can do four minutes then five is better and i'm a better breath work i'm more spiritually breath worky because i and then i'll do a oh no that guy's done seven minutes now and it just becomes an endless road to nowhere without realizing that if you can it's the principle of being able to put yourself into the ice and then still connect to yourself and not think you're going to die or think you're going to die and be able to move into it, be willing to go through that. That in itself is the thing. It's not how long. It's not the temperature was one degree colder. It's the fact that you're willing to put yourself there. And for most people in society that never do anything like that in their life, because they are in the convenience trap, they are always outsourcing. They are always looking for something. Oh, the medical system will save me. No one's saving you from an ice bath and you can get out at any time. So you're willingly there. So I think it's a, an amazing thing. And I think any anytime somebody gets thrust into pop culture like Wim Hof, I think they're doing a massive service. I think it's also a, a, a good barometer for who you are to be able to go, do you worship that or do you see that as the thing? And now you just paint yourself as a Wim Hof practitioner or whatever else, which in, of, in and of itself isn't bad. As I say, that continues to reach mainstream people. But it's like, if somebody's on a path of wanting to get like, that's why I called it Beyond Breath, the program, because it's like there's a lot more. If you can connect to that essence of breath, well, then what's beyond breath? It comes from somewhere else. So it's just like it's a way that you can get deeper and deeper and deeper without limiting yourself to a particular style or a way or a temperature or a time or a, anything like that. Bear introduced me to Wim Hof maybe like 2018, 17. I was, I was kind of dealing with migraines at that time. And I got to say, man, I went all in. I did Wim Hof Method every day for a year straight, did cold showers for a year straight. And that's kind of my personality. When I go for something, I really go for something. And I must say it was life-changing. It was really life-changing. It, it got me connected to the power of breath. It helped me get beyond uh, my limitations in, in relation to the cold. 
and not being such a pansy about the cold because I used to always hate the cold. And now surfing up here has really helped that too. But that being said, that's a great point, Tom, is uh, is a wonderful transitional phase for folks that have never considered this. And at Music and Sky, we try to get everybody in the, we do ice baths there. We try to get everybody in the ice bath for however they're comfortable. We have people that guide you through. And those that have never done it before, it's a lot of fun. Like I run over to, st- when I hear, hey, we got a newbie, we got an ice bath virgin. I run over because it's so great to see um, the transformation that can come from just doing something as simple and sit, as sitting with your breath for three minutes in a freezing cold ice bath. I, it, it's a powerful modality for sure. Well, the, the first realization with that is a rite of passage. It's just about changing your mind and not being afraid of it. So, I mean, yeah. just right there is, is amazing. And, and I think there's amazing health benefits too. Uh, I learned that a long time ago during two days, it was mandatory after every single, you know, long day of practice, you had to just immerse in, in, you know, one of those big aluminum tubs that they have in the training room. And uh, man, I used to hate that, but uh, you just got used to it to the point where you just sat in it and we didn't have breathing techniques or anything, but, (laughs) but uh, it, it just healed your body. And the next day you felt like you didn't even, weren't even in the middle of two days the next day. So it absolutely works. And, you know, at this point in my life, when I do do that kind of cold therapy and uh, cold therapy is just right down at the river here, because it's, we, we live on the South Fork of the Smith River and a lot of the water comes up subterranean. So it's ice cold most of the year. And uh, yeah, it's just amazing. You can be working outside and and be kind of beat up and, you know, the sun all day, you go jump in there and you're instantly energized, just your whole body tingles. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, more than just a little bit to it for sure. And then somebody like Wim Hof, who, I mean, he's next level. Uh, I've done it a lot in all those different types of situations, but swimming under the polar cap, (laughs) you know, that kind of stuff. That's just, you know, he's, he's totally insane. So obviously he's tapped into something on a whole nother level. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And with things like that though, uh, this is something I always consider because I always like to, not, not necessarily devil's advocate, but just like question what I'm seeing in front of me, right? So somebody like that, I'll take Paul Check an example and I'll get to Wim Hof. Like I learned a lot of my formal holistic alternative health through Paul Check's work. But then there's always this element because it's marketed as like Paul's ripped at 50 or Paul's a 60 year old and he still looks like he's a very, very fit man. And I'm like, but could Paul be eating McDonald's and telling you to flick it, like do that practice every day and still look like that? Is it really a representation of his teachings that that's how he looks, for example, right? Because most people are just like, well, Paul looks great. I'll do all of his stuff. Now, in and of itself, it's not a bad thing because people that are on that level of uh, where they're at in their life, that's still going to lead them to good information. But it's going to enslave or entrap at some point as well. And likewise, is Wim just wired that way? Was he, and I don't know his backstory, maybe he was, like, was he ever a sickly, never functioned, like, couldn't couldn't even take a shower for a minute in tepid water, and then did the breath work that he prescribes and then can swim under polar ice caps? Or is he just an anomaly that happens to also do breath work? Do you know what I mean? Like, what is it that creates that? Because it's obviously not, um, it's obviously not, repeatable by everybody that does Wim Hof style breath work, if you want to call it that. Not everybody's going to be able to do that and swim under a polar ice cap. It's just another level. And that, like, I get inspired by that for sure, because I just go, that's what human beings are capable of. But then it brings me back to, I would love to look into his eyes. I would love to see if I can look into the deeper layers of him and just go, where the fu- where, where's that guy from? Because <laughs> he might not be Why? from the same place as I am. I think as usual, we put the cart before the horse, you know, we're, we're always coming from the point of physical. Does that thing make us better or does our innate nature, the thing that drives us to those endeavors in the first place. So what does a Paul check and a Wim Hof have in common? Well, um, I don't know either one of them personally, but from the outside, it looks like they're really engaged in life. They love to learn no matter how old they are. They're always pushing the envelope, whether it's, uh, you know, physical testing themselves physically or otherwise. Uh, they're both deeply delving into matters of spirit. So I think with whatever they came into this game with that led them into that is probably what allows them to be who they are 
and not because of the physical things. Yeah, that's I just agree. what I think. Yeah, sounds right to me. That'd be a fun hang. Awesome. I'll tell you that. Bring them up yeah. to the farm. All all of us just hang out at the farm. Bear. That'd be a really fun weekend. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a blast. We can all dig holes and jump in the river. <laughs> uh hey man tom this has been such a great chat as always dude don't want to take too much more of your time i know you're a busy dude and you're just kind of starting your day uh you're uh you're in, in the future actually from where we're at um where can people find this uh course and get access to all this plus uh see all your other awesome streams uh, yeah, I can actually start streaming again now, which I just started doing. But um, my website is tombarnett.tv and the Beyond Breath is on there. I also have the Living Free Movement, which is where we have a uh, an online platform where we go through various aspects of uh, lawful remedy and learning about oneself. We've got a whole health side of that as well. Um, a Bible studies bit, which is non-religious. It's from one of the guys that studied the Bible his whole life, basically. And he was a USC fighter. And uh, he's just got like this whole way of doing a non-religious look at the Bible, which is quite good. We've got a growing section. It's What we do is really similar to what you guys do as well. I think we've got a lot of crossover, which is why at some point, I think it'd be awesome to host like a, um, a festival that's held at the same time where you guys have it where you are, similar to Music and Sky. But if you had it at your farm, like you're trying to you know, get that going, we've got this property we're building out in the Byron Hints land. And I think we have so many similarities. It'd be cool to run like a retreat at the same time. Not a retreat. What do you call it? Like a festival where people come and they learn and they engage and just, you know, do good stuff in life. We got a, a cold water creek that runs through there. I've got a, a plateau that overlooks like this huge gorge in the mountain and stuff. So, uh, yeah, and do ice baths and saunas and have so music. So do you pick and have summer or, or do we pick summer? <laughs> well, that's the thing. I don't know. You know what we could do is do spring and autumn where it's more or less... Or yeah. we could do it on an equinox or something where it's like yeah. a similar point in time for everyone's in a yeah. changeover. That'd be a cool time to do it as well. Yeah. But I just, that's why I've always liked since I met you guys, I've liked what you do because I think we're on similar paths. We do some things differently that like say there's no right or wrong way I see of doing anything, but I always learn from, um, you know, when I tap into what you're doing and I think I just like, I just like it because obviously I'm trying to do similar stuff in life. So it's, it's nice and it's refreshing. It's inspiring to come across other people on something similar doing it differently so it's just like you know there's it just makes me feel uh, energized about what i'm doing as well to see you guys doing what you do and but uh yeah that's that, that i think alone is what's keep gives me a lot of energy is what's being created and what i'm uh involved in at the moment as well yeah and um that's why we're all finding each other now we're all you know, resonating on the same level. And, and, and I think that's the whole point is we're helping each other remember. And so when we're talking about, is it uh divine timing for us to wake up? Well, there's a uh, good reason why we're all together and helping each other out. And one of these days I am going to make it to Byron Bay. I told you the story first time we met Tom, where uh, we yeah, actually were immigrating to Australia and we're headed to Byron Bay. And that was in about 75. And I just thought it was a perfect environment. Byron Bay was pretty, uh, you know, just a, a lot different back then, pretty raw. So we thought it was a perfect place. The only problem is, is I ended up in Fiji along the way and didn't want to leave Fiji. So uh, loved the waves and everything there. So I still haven't made it to Byron Bay, but I'm going to get there someday. You know what? It's interesting because when what you saw in it, I don't think is there anymore. But what you saw uh -huh. is, I see is the surface layer, right? But that surface layer is met or is a result of the, the what's underneath. And the energy underneath, I don't think's changed. So it's like, it's the same. It's a very powerful land. And I think you might've been attracted to that because you're a more, you, you weren't coming for the hippie, uh, I'm assuming. <laughs> you weren't coming to smoke pot and, and be on a hippie festival. You were coming because you kind of realize maybe this land has something powerful about it and that hasn't changed. It's been infiltrated yeah. on various levels, but you can't change what it is. So that's still there. And I think I was going to mention it before. Just one thing, last thing I'll say is I know of several people who uh, they tell, they talk to me about, you know, the old mystery schools. They talk to me about the Magi's. They talk to me about the alchemists and they're really unhappy because they're like, the Magi's were all killed off. They're not around anymore. 
and the al- all the alchemy was lost. And, uh, and I'm like, but it's not though, because I see it as maybe it got splintered away because it was targeted at some point, but it doesn't mean it's gone because there's still magic there. Like if the magic is there, then the magi are there. Just because they're not all in one location that you can physically go and see or meet or shake hands with, it doesn't mean they're not there. And I think it's important for people to realize that um, it doesn't disappear. It might fragment. Like in old martial arts, people used to train martial arts and then the governments or whatever were like, you're not allowed to do that because you're a threat to our... So they still practiced it, but they just used farming tools or they practiced their carters or something, which was the same stuff, just disguised as a dance or whatever. So I think it's important to realize that uh, that all of that stuff that people still want to be there is is still there. But you also have to have the eyes to see it. You have to have the ability. You have to you know know that you're not coming from that place of fear or lack where it's like, oh, this world's shit now because there's no magis anymore. The alchemy's all lost. And it's like, is it though? Because I see it all the time. And the more you can get to that, then the more you do remember and the more you can access that for yourself. And yeah, I mean, as always, you know, if you guys ever came, I'd love to be able to put you guys up around here. I, I think you'd find this land still has a lot of the magic and one of the reasons you would have been attracted to here in the first place is definitely it still has it. You're just going to have to also see like, you know, <laughs> what was built on top of it, but it's it's still there. Yeah, I've always had an attraction in Australia. I don't know if you can see in my back wall there, uh, way in the back, that's Uluru. And oh, uh, yeah, anyway, yep. yeah, so anyway, um, special, special place, and uh, yeah, always felt an affinity for it. So I know I've got to get there someday, and you yeah. being well, there and uh, us connecting, all the more reason now. Definitely. That's actually called the solar plexus of the earth. And that energy yeah. line, the ley line that runs from there, runs right through Byron before it heads out off to some other Oh, lands. really? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Mm. That's amazing. Well, Tom, Tom such, thanks such a so pleasure. much. Um, yeah, just always great connecting. Thanks for being with us, making time. And uh, hope we see you on this end too. Uh, next year, if your travels bring you back down this way in the Pacific Northwest, you know you've always got a place to stay. Thanks. Yeah, in a year, that's the plan. So looking forward to it. Thanks for having me too. Awesome. Love the chat with you guys. Okay, You're awesome, man. Hey, we'll put all your links in the show notes below, guys. Please go support Tom in all his efforts. You will be well rewarded for that. And uh, yeah, I love the idea of doing the of doing that festival idea, small little gatherings like that across the plane uh, in sympathetic resonance, right? Affecting the field together. Very, very cool idea. And I do like the idea of doing it on the equinoxes. That makes a lot of sense. So we will follow up on that, I'm sure, my friend. Okay, guys, thanks so much. Enjoy uh, your, get outside, get your feet in the dirt, go for a hike, go plant something Jump into your garden right now if you can. That's what I'm going to go do and recharge and give Mother Nature some love. And we'll see you next week. Love you guys. Take care.